Good morning and welcome to class. Welcome to Bible Doctrine 2. So good to be with you guys again this week. I'm praying and believing that everything went great over the weekend, that you guys had incredible church, and that you also had incredible Friday fire. I am excited. We are getting so much deeper into this year, into the second term. Before you know it, it'll already be Christmas break, and I know that some of you guys are excited about that, and then third term will already be here. Matter of fact, I spent some time yesterday evening mapping out our lesson plan and also the lesson plan for the other courses that I'm teaching, and we are getting so close, and so I have mapped out to where uh, it looks like that we are going to be able to get all the way through Bible Doctrine 1, 2, 3, and Bible Doctrine 4 by the end of the year. And that'll be great. That'll be good to have all of those uh, in our lesson repertoire. It'll be great to have that done. And, uh, you know, give it or take, we may have to combine a lesson if, or if I feel to extend a lesson. We're going to do this according to uh, the will of God the best that we can. I really feel like that this class is laying a great biblical foundation in our lives for the things that that uh, we need to know in order to have a very productive, long-lasting ministry. So good to be in the house uh, in teaching today. And uh, before we get into our lesson, we're going to go into lesson number five today. We're going to talk about the fall of man. But before we get into that and begin our review, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help us today. Can we do that? Lord, we love you. We need you, God. We stand here fully knowing, acknowledging that we cannot teach these lessons without you. We cannot teach these lessons without the anointing of the Holy Ghost. God, I pray that you cleanse our hearts. God, that you would forgive us. If there be anything unlike you in us, please anoint us, forgive us. God, we need your touch today. We need your mercy. We need your grace. We need your understanding. And God, we need revelation to come to us as we begin to deal with these lessons. Doctrine is so important. God, give every student a love for the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. We're going to get into Bible Doctrine 2, lesson number uh, 5 today. Lesson number 5 and is the fall of man. And lesson number 5, the fall of man, is on page number 26 See if I can get that to show up. It's on lesson 26 in my book. It should be that in yours, or at least I hope that it is. We are going to get into that lesson today, and we are going to talk about the fall of man, the condition of man. And as you guys know, in a review in Bible Doctrine 2, we have talked about the angels. In lesson number 2, we talked about the devil. Lesson 3, we began to lay a foundational understanding of what sin is. Lesson number four, we talked about man and how man was created, and he was created intellectually, he was created morally. That was a really cool lesson, how God began to bring things to pass. He gave us the ability of choice, and we talked about how relationship comes at that ability to choose. Something very powerful happens when we could choose to do uh you know, to not do, but then we choose to do it. There's something very powerful about that, not only in the spiritual realm, but also in the physical realm and relationships that we have with one another, whether it's our friends, it's our family, or whether it's the future or, uh, of our marriages. When we choose to love, there is something very powerful about that. And it's the same with God. He gave us the ability of choice. And the reason for that is is so that we could choose to worship him. And when we choose to worship him, something incredibly powerful happens. Amen. And so then we're getting into lesson four, talked about man, lesson five. Then today we're going to talk about the fall of man, the fall of man. So letter A says in our lesson, page number 26, lesson number five, the fall of man, a, the steps in the fall of man. And for our scriptural references, we're going to go to Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 1. Genesis 3 and 1 said, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? 
And then Genesis 3 and 3 says this, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now there's a powerful um, a meaning and revelation behind that scripture that we'll get into in just a little bit. And then Genesis 3 and verse number 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And then 1 Timothy 2, 14, And Adam was not deceived. This is powerful right here. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. That is a very powerful scripture. I want you to leave a note by that. We're going to get into that. This this second, this second, 1 Timothy 2.14 scripture will preach. It'll preach outside of the lesson that we're going to get into today. But it's going to talk about the fall of man. Matter of fact, um, you want to preach a powerful crusade message, you can do that out of 1 Timothy uh, 2 and 14. I just uh, saw this and got this revelation during our lesson today. I took some notes. I already sent it out to some guys. It's like, this is powerful. This will preach. And so I'm going to I'm going to get to that in just a little bit in our lesson. A study of the above scriptures will show that there were some definite steps that took place in the fall of man. And so if we can know those steps, then we can guard our lives against those steps. It's very important. That's why the Bible said, with all thy getting, get understanding. And so I don't want to just have a, a head knowledge of the word of God. I also want to have a heart knowledge of the word of God. But I want understanding of the word. I don't want to just know the stories. I don't want to just be able to tell the stories. I, I, I don't want to just be able to talk about the stories. But I want to have understanding of the things of God. I want to have understanding of the word of God. There is something powerful about that understanding. If I can understand, understanding is so valuable. It is to be treasured above all gold. It's to be treasured above all all silver. Uh, there is no value, no price that could be paid or traded for understanding. Understanding is one of the most valuable things that you could ever have. Understanding gives you revelation of God. Understanding gives you revelation of the Word of God. Understanding gives you such equipment for victory in your life to be able to know. So understanding, there is a process. Now, I'm not a math guy. I don't really like math. I know math. I know that one plus one is two. I know that three plus three is six. I know math. But understanding of the Word of God is like math. There is an equation to living for God. For example, repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, and infilling of the Holy Ghost. Those three things, that is the equation to salvation. That is the beginning of salvation in our lives. And I understand that we need to mature and go on to live in holiness and separation under the Lord. But that is the beginning of things. And so we bring understanding to the steps. We know repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, infilling of the Holy Ghost, evidence of speaking in other tongues. There is a process to everything. It, when he got ready to make the tabernacle, there was a process. When it came to building the ark, there was a process. Even to the instruments of the ministry within the tabernacle, there was a process. This is how I want them built. This is how I want them done. With everything with God, even to the feast, everything from Genesis to Revelation, there was a process. If I know the process, then the process will help me move forward. It will also help me guard my life. So if I can look at the life of Adam and Eve, and if I can look at the fall of man, that fall of man gives me the process of failure. There is a process of victory, and there is a process of failure. If I know the process of failure, I come to an understanding of that process. If I do this, I will fail. If I take step one, two, and three, or whatever, 
I will fail. If I know the process, I can guard against it. And so that's why it's very valuable for us to look and understand the fall of man. Why did man fall? What caused man to fall? Because with that comes the understanding of the process of failure. And that'll, that'll preach in itself. The process of failure, you don't want to go down the process of failure. I don't want to go down the road of failure. I want to be on the road, the pathway that leads to, to power and, and life in the Holy Ghost. And not just life, but abundant life. That's what I want. I thank God for revelation that's coming to us today because God wants to help us know the process. And so there was a definite process that happened that caused man to fall. Number one, there was unbelief that came into the life of Adam and Eve. Now, uh, all of us can deal with unbelief at times. Matter of fact, the man in the Bible that had the son that was possessed by devils, he said, Lord, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. Having moments of unbelief is not a sin, but living a lifestyle of unbelief becomes part of the process of failure. So where there is unbelief, we need to have honesty with God and say, Lord, help me. I believe, but help thou my unbelief. I want that out of my life because that is the beginning of the process of failure. I don't want to lead down the road of failure. I want faith. Faith is the process, the beginning of the process of victory. Unbelief is the process of failure. I don't want to do that. I want to have faith. Don't you want to have faith? I want to have faith in the things of God. I want to set my feet on the firm foundation of faith and the word of God so that I'm not deceived. I don't want to begin the journey. The journey of failure begins with unbelief. The first step was that Satan was able to plant a doubt, a seed of unbelief in the heart of Eve. Unbelief is the beginning of failure. Unbelief is the beginning of going down the road that will cause you to fall. Number two, we got to be very careful with this, and I want to talk to us about this number two just a little bit, because in your notebook, I want you to make note beside uh, this number two. Number two says changing God's word. The first step to the life of failure is unbelief. The next step down that road of failure is changing the word of God. After Eve entered doubt in her heart, she was now ready to tamper with God's word. Changing God's word to make it say what we want it to say instead of what it really says is always going to lead to a life of failure. That's why the book of Revelation says that we're accursed if we add to or we take away from the word of God. When you get doubt in your heart, you will begin to change the word of God to fit what you feel instead of what God says. We've got a war against that in our mind. That's why Bible doctrine 1, 2, three and four is so vitally important at Acts Bible School is because getting doctrine in our heart will help us war against uh, this tampering with the word of God. I, I have seen it so much lately and I, I've talked about it with some of my other classes and some of my mentors and friends we're seeing so much being tampered with today. Well, does the Word of God really say that? Oh, I don't really think it means that anymore. Well, if the Word of God meant it then, it still means it now because the Word of God is an unchanging Word. The Word of God is a sure foundation. And when we begin to change what thus saith the Word of God, what thus saith the Lord, we are on the pathway to failure. When we begin to doubt the things of God, we will begin to manipulate uh, the word of God. That, that's what we need. to. When we doubt, we will begin to manipulate. If we do not get the doubt taken care of, we'll start manipulating the word to mean what we say. Now, I want to go ahead and talk to you about this number two in your book, but, but I want us to be very cautious with this. And I want us to leave a side note for the lesson because uh, the writer of the lesson goes on to say that um, Eve both changed and added to God's word. 
God said nothing about touching the fruit. Now, this is in your notes, number two. Uh, it said that God said nothing about touching the fruit, and death was to be certain. Eve's word, lest you die, left a doubt. It raised a question whether or not death was certain. Now, I, I want to be very careful, and I want to be very respectful of, of everything that, that is happening in uh, the Holy Ghost in our lives and the things that we're learning. But I want us to look and, and be very careful. This is where I want you to take note, okay? Ver, this number two, the, the author of the lesson, very, very great man, talks about Eve changing the word of God. We don't actually know if Eve changed the word of God. Because the Bible gives us a very definite timeline, okay? This is kind of a, a side note, but I felt it very important for our lesson today because I don't want to just leave us without this understanding. And this is a powerful principle that I'll preach because I want you to watch the timeline. God created Adam from the dust of the earth. God created man, breathed into him. He became a living soul. We'll get into this later, but it means being. He became a living being, a living person. But I want you to notice the timeline. Genesis chapter 2, God has created man, but he has not yet created woman. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the midst of the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man. Now, did you notice that? Genesis 2 and verse 15, or verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man. God commanded the man. Talking to Adam, he commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, the time frame, the timeline, God created man, then God took man, put him in the garden, and God spoke to man and told him, told him, said, if you eat of this, you're going to die. Don't eat the fruit. God told man, your King James Version text, God told the man. Then, after he told the man, then, immediately after that, he puts man to sleep and takes out a rib of man and creates woman. Eve was not there when God said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, the next, uh, the only time we hear Eve talking about uh, the discussion that God had with her husband, Adam, is with the serpent. And she tells the serpent, I'm not supposed to eat of that fruit. I'm not supposed to eat of that tree. I'm not supposed to eat of it, and I'm not supposed to touch it. Now, the writer of our lesson says that Eve changed the word of God. Well, first of all, Eve wasn't there when God gave that command. So it leaves us with the reasonable expectation that it was not God that told Eve not to touch it, but it was Adam that told God or told Eve, don't touch that because Adam loved his wife. He loved her so much that he chose to follow her instead of obey God. That's a bad thing. And we can get into that more in relationship class later. There's, there's powerful things in that. However, it could be said that Eve did not change the word of God. It could be said that Adam is the one that added to the word of God. Now, is that wrong? Is that wrong? Well, think about this because Adam is trying to protect his wife. Adam becomes the symbol, like a, a, a protector of his wife. And maybe, because we don't know, because the Bible doesn't say. And because the Bible doesn't say, I don't believe that this lesson that number two can be used in the way that the author of the lesson has stated. Is, the, is he still stating a fact? Yes, changing the word of God will, in fact, lead you down the road of failure. However, I do not personally believe that his example used as reference fits the context of the verse because it could be. See, think about this. If you cannot touch the fruit then you certainly cannot eat the fruit. 
Does that make sense? So it could have been, we don't know. And because we don't know, the author doesn't know either. And we cannot state things as doctrine that we do not know. That's very important. Because technically, if we do not know, then the author would have added to the word of God also. See what I'm saying? Uh, don't, don't overthink that. That's just, that's just what it is. It could have been that Adam loved his wife enough that he said, we can't touch that fruit. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's adding to also. You can't do that. Well, I want you to think about this. There come a time that Israel gets out of e Egypt and they're going toward Mount Sinai and there's thunder and lightning and it scares Israel to death. They've never seen God work like that. They've never seen him speak on this wise before. The Bible said they were afraid and they said, Moses, you go up before God. And God speaks to Moses and said, Moses, if they touch the mountain, they're going to die. Where does the mountain begin? And God speaks to Moses and says, Moses, you draw the line where the mountain begins. What? You do that. It could be that Adam was drawing the line. If you do not touch the fruit, you cannot eat the fruit. God allowed Moses to say, this is the line. This is the boundary of where the mountain begins. Pastor Scott Graham uh, has preached a powerful message on that. Where does the mountain begin? The man of God has the biblical authority to say, don't touch that because if you can't touch it, you can't eat it. The, the man of God has the biblical authority to say, we're going to draw the line in holiness and our separation right here because if we don't go past this, we can never do that sinful thing. And I would much rather a man or a woman of God draw a line that protected me from falling than, than just let me get uh, so close that I accidentally fail. I don't want to do that. I want to draw a line in my ministry. And when I pastor, I want to draw a line and that, that says, this is the mountain. This is where the mountain begins. If you don't touch it, you can't eat it. Now, I'm just telling you right now, God has set some things in order and some parameters in order that says, if you don't touch it, you can't eat it. And I'm telling you right now, there's some things in our lives that we need to let go of. We need to examine ourselves and say, hey God, am I getting too close to the world? Am I beyond the place that the mountain starts? Because I don't want to, I don't want to die. Moses drew the line. If you pass this line, you're not just on a road to fail. You're, you've already failed. What is the process? And so I, I wanted to, to be careful with that. So before we accuse Eve of something that we really don't have Bible proof of, let's be very cautious with that because lest someone read this lesson and they could say, we are doing what the author says not to do, yet he's doing himself. We don't want to be that way. We, that's why we need to have these personal conversations and these between our class and our, ourselves so that we don't make statements that we cannot back up biblically. We need to draw the line. The end of the day, the saying is true. If you change the word of God, it will lead you down a pathway of destruction. We need to get unbelief out of our life. We need to make sure that we're not trying to manipulate the word of God to mean what we want it to, that we are saying it and taking it for what it is. And number three, on the steps that leads to, to failing, number three, after the seed uh, is disobedience, after the seed of unbelief was sown and God's word was changed, an act of disobedience was the natural result. When we have unbelief, and when we change the word of God, this is powerful, powerful, powerful teaching. When you have unbelief that leads you to manipulate the word of God to mean whatever you want it to mean, then you will disobey the word because you change the word. The natural result of unbelief that is unchecked in the spirit and changing the word of God is disobedience. Genesis 3 and 6, the steps leading to disobedience are named. She saw, she desired, and then the Bible says she took and she did eat. Those are the steps that led to her fall. And on page 27, it says, It is profitable for us to compare this with Achan's sin that is recorded in Joshua 7 and 21. Achan saw, Achan coveted, Achan took, and Achan hid. There is a 
threefold temptation. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, number one, and the lust of the eyes, number two, and the pride of life, number three, is not of the Father, but of this world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are not of God. They are of the world. They are the products of fallen man. They are the products of someone who has had unchecked unbelief, someone that has manipulated or changed the word of God to fit what they want instead of what God wants and then fell into disobedience. Those things, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life will run rampant in a life that is unchecked by the word of God. We need a life that is checked by the word of God. Both Eve's temptation and the temptation of Christ in the wilderness may be summed up under all that is in this world. John 1, or 1 John 2, 16, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Eve's temptation in Genesis 3 and 6, good for food, pleasant to the eyes, desired to make one wise, and then compared uh, thirdly to Christ's temptation in Luke 4, 3 through 10, stone that it be bread, kingdoms of this world, cast thyself down and the angels will gather thee up. All these things can be summed up in not only the temptation of Eve, but also the temptation of Christ. Not only can they be summed up in the temptation of Eve and the temptation of Christ, but they can also be summed up in the temptation of every one of us. Why? Because it all falls under the same category because when there is unchecked unbelief, when there is a uh, manipulation of the word of God, then there is disobedience and those things lead to unchecked things of this world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. In the temptation of Satan, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He omitted the important part. This is powerful right here. I, I underlined this in red, even wrote the word wow out beside it. They should know good, but not be able to perform it. They would know good. They would understand good, but not be able to perform it. And they would know evil but not be able to avoid it. I, I, I underlined that in red, wrote the word wow out beside it. That is incredible and will preach because they should know good, but not be able to perform it. And they that would know evil would not be able to avoid it. It should be remembered that temptation itself is not a sin, but yielding to temptation is a sin. I had this conversation with a new convert a while back. He was telling me, oh, I, I still have these desires and I'm still tempted and I feel so ashamed. And I told them, you're, you're still in the learning process of growing out of those things into new things. And it's the same way with all of us that have been living for God for a long time. Temptation is not the sin. Yielding to the temptation is the sin. Eve was defeated as soon as she began to tamper with the word of God, the things of God. The seed of unbelief sown in her heart by the devil caused her to change and add to God's word, according to the author. Thus, she fell. On the other hand, Jesus Christ quoted God's word and thus won the victory. It is written, I will put the devil to flight every time when you disobey you will go down a pathway of destruction. But when you follow in obedience to the word of God, it will always lead you to a life of overcoming power. It should be noted, and we're on page 28, it should be noted that it was Eve who was deceived in the transgression. Adam deliberately, now this is, this is a, a a sermon that I told you in the very beginning that I, I'm working on right now, and I'm going to preach this. I never really, I never seen this in the same context until today. But if you go back 
uh, just and we'll reference it back at the I'll read it for you in the first of our lesson, First Timothy two fourteen. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived. Adam was in 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 transgression. But I want you to watch this. It should be noted that it was Eve who was deceived in transgression, and it was Adam who deliberately chose to sin. Adam disobeyed with the full realization of what he was doing. It was a clear decision of choosing fellowship with his wife over fellowship with God. Adam chose the woman, thus he fell. Now the reason this is powerful is because Adam, Eve was deceived and sinned. And there was forgiveness for her because there was a, yes, there was the consequences of sin in her life. And we'll talk more about that later in just in the next section. Yes, there was consequences of sin, but God took that first sacrifice of an animal and clothed them with the skin of an animal. He clothed Adam and he clothed Eve. Now this is cool. And this is why I don't preach because Eve was deceived. She fell into it because she was deceived. She was tricked into sinning. But Adam knew what he was doing and deliberately went into it. Now, there are some times in our lives that we accidentally mess up. There are other times that we know full well what we're doing and we still do it. Now, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, to those that sin willingly or willfully, there remaineth no sacrifice. Now, this is why this is powerful. There, there, there doesn't, in other words, when you sin knowing that you sin, he does not have to forgive you because he's already given himself for you and now you chose to do your own thing anyway. However, the balance of that text is when we sin or if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father that when we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Now we have an example of Adam and Eve where God forgave one that fell into it by deception and we have God forgiving one that walked into it knowingly. I am so thankful. I am so, and this is why this will preach. There are people that are living under condemnation thinking, oh, can God forgive me? I knew I was doing wrong and I still did it. I want you to know, if you know to do right, you need to do right. I, I'm not condoning sin. I'm preaching against sin, but I'm also preaching against condemnation because you don't have to be condemned. God will forgive you if you're deceived into it, and God will forgive you if you ran into it knowing what you were doing. But I'm telling you, we don't need to take the, the grace of God for granted. We need to be thankful. Oh, I'm, I'm so thankful, God, that, that even though Adam knew full well, you still forgave him. And Eve was deceived and you still forgave her. I am thankful for the grace of God that works in the lives of men and women. I'm thankful that when it was an accident, he forgave me. When I messed up, he forgave me. And when it was deliberate, he forgave me too. I'm not proud of messing up. I'm not proud of it being deliberate. But I am so thankful that the grace of God sustains us when we need it the most. So, C, what is the result of the fall? Man, that stuff will preach. I'm telling you, that'll preach. The results of the fall. The results of the fall on nature. Genesis 3.17 said the ground was cursed. Genesis 3.18 said the ground was to bring forth thorns and thistles. Before that, there was no thorns, there was no thistles. And now, the results of the fall on the human race. The Bible said that in Galatians 3.22 and Romans 5.19, all are concluded under sin. The word concluded there means enclosed in. All of us are enclosed in sin. All of humanity. That is the result of the fall. Then B, man became the child of the devil. C, man shall live by hard labor. You got to go to work. You got to work. You can't put your hand to the plow and look back. You can't be lazy. You got to go to work. D, woman shall bring forth children in sorrow. E, through the fall, man became subject to, number one, physical death. Number two, spiritual death. Number three, eternal death. Physical death, that is the death that comes now to the flesh. In Adam and Eve's day, they did not die. They would have lived forever. Now we die. Spiritual death, that is the separation from God. 
and then eternal death. That is the second death of spiritual death continued after physical death. That is the prolonged being separated from God. It's eternal. That is the place of hell, death, the grave. That is the place where those, they are eternally separated from God. I never, ever, ever, ever want to be eternally separated from God. I don't ever want to be spiritually separated from God. That's why I'm thankful for the death, burial, and resurrection that redeemed us or give us the ability to be redeemed. The results of the fall are all around us. Hospitals, prisons, asylums are full. Misery, crime, and unhappiness meet us at every turn. And all these are direct results of the fall of man. Letter D, definitions of life and death. The student of God's word should have a clear understanding of the meaning of life and death. Physical life that is, this is the union of the spirit of man with his body. Physical death, this is the separation of the spirit from the body. Spiritual life, this is the union of the spirit of man with the spirit of God. This brings fellowship with God and eternal life. Number four, spiritual death. This is the separation of man's spirit from God's spirit. Five, eternal life. This is the union of man's spirit with God's spirit, made eternal and never ending. Number six, eternal death. This is the separation of man's spirit from God's spirit, made eternal and never ending. Eternal life is heaven. Eternal death is hell. Note, eternal life is only found in Jesus Christ. The Christian who has Jesus abiding in his heart has eternal life. If Jesus is not there, there can be no eternal life. That's why the Word of God says, without the Spirit, you are none of His. Actually, eternal life refers to the quality of life as much, if not more than the quantity of life. God wants to help us, redeem us from being fallen man. I'm so thankful today that God forgives those that stumble into it, and God forgives those that intentionally fall into it. I am thankful today to know that we do not have to remain fallen. I'm also thankful that God is helping us, giving us understanding of the steps to failure, unchecked unbelief, manipulation of the Word of God, and disobedience to the Word of God will always lead to failure. But if you have faith in your heart and you abide by the Word of God, and you hear the things of God, and you do the things of God, they will lead to life. One leads to fall, one leads to life. And the Lord said he came to give life, came to give it more abundantly. Thank God for the understanding. Thank God for understanding today that we can know I don't have to live and take the steps of failure, but I can take the steps of victory in life. God bless you. So good to be with you today. Thank you for being so attentive in class. Thank you, Sir Sampson, for all that you're doing. Thank you, staff. Thank you, Axe Bible School. Thank you, students. God bless you, and I will see you in our next class. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.